What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I'm joined by my man Noah at FB God on Twitter. You can go follow me at Nick underscore PDGE. Um, this is uh, a, a, a weird kind of episode, I guess, today. We're going to be looking at specifically quarterbacks, but we're going to be looking at quarterbacks who have interesting schedules at the beginning of the season, uh, at the end of the season. Um, I, I'm someone who very much advocates for playing in super flex leagues. I think that's something that we're going to see um, becoming more and more popular and becoming mainstream when it comes to fantasy. Uh, I think we have like a tendency as as fo- fantasy players to kind of make all the positions uh, equal equal in scoring settings, I guess you can say. Uh, and that's why I think we see like two quarterbacks in super flex become more, uh, more popular because, you know, you look at quarterbacks in a one quarterback league and they don't really mean anything right you could stream them and whatnot um, but as soon as you add the super flex to the two quarterback dimension to it now they're super important and I think after super flex becomes the mainstream of fantasy then we're going to see tight end premium leagues start to become more and more mainstream and I see them become a little bit more popular um, each year and I really forgot why I'm even on this tangent but we're talking about quarterbacks <laughs> because they are still important that's why because I'm going to tell you to change your league to super flex and then all these quarterbacks that we're going to talk about become important. Um, so, Noah, please take the mic out of my hand because I uh, my my mind is moving like fucking Play-Doh right now. All right. But welcome, cue, guys. Welcome. Cue the intro. So first off, we're going to look at a pretty controversial quarterback, right? Josh Allen, Buffalo Bills, currently the QB 15. And I know Nick has a bunch of takes about him. We'll get into those later. But one thing you can't deny is Wait less. Up. Wait up. I, I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intro something, not intro something, but um, break down what exactly the video is a little, a little yeah. further. Uh, yeah, so, so what we're really going to do today is discuss, I don't know, a handful, maybe five, six quarterbacks who either have difficult – early season schedules, but um, good playoff schedules and vice versa. Because as you're playing in a lot of one quarterback leagues, um, obviously streaming becomes a massive part of it. And I'm someone who always advocates streaming and late late round quarterbacks when you're in a one quarterback league. Um, so, you know, having an eye on guys that you can kind of combine. I don't really like to draft two quarterbacks with uh, within a one quarterback league because they'll always be available on the wire. I'd rather use those draft spots for skill positions. Um, but we will talk about some guys um, who have maybe tough early season schedules. So maybe you don't want to draft them, but have them on your radar for someone that has an easy early season schedule. Um, and then maybe their schedule picks up in, in a good way when it comes to um, the defenses that are playing against at the back half of the schedule. The other, also, the other thing, I'm sorry, like I'm just going to keep going on tangents here, Noah. So feel free to jump in and interrupt me at any time. But um, strength of schedule. I get a lot of questions about this. As soon as like the schedule drops for the NFL, like, are you going to do strength of schedule, uh, you know, content or whatever? And the way I look at it is, is like, I think it's a waste of time because you really don't know um, what teams are going to be until like six or eight weeks really into the season when it comes to defense, uh, their defense, unless they're the very elite or the very bottom, bottom handful of teams. And I think it's because year over year, we don't see a lot of defenses like elite defenses very rarely stay at the top, right? Some good ones will stay there for a couple of years in a row. And I think the reason is, you know, you look at like NBA teams, how they're set up, right? They're so drastically affected by one player. And, and in the NFL, it's like, there's one position that makes or breaks a team and it's the quarterback, right? So if you have the same quarterback or you have an elite quarterback year over year, over year, they stay healthy. You can pretty much tell how a team is going to do, right? Um, you know, a few surrounding pieces will change the, the, the dynamic of the team a little bit, but for the most part, the, the value that a uh, quarterback brings to an NFL team is just so far superior to every other position on the field, right? So um, when you're projecting a team, you could look at the quarterback and, and kind of expect how a team is going to do based on that because they make such a heavy impact. But when you look at the defense, it's very hard to because you don't have, I mean, you have a, a few select few players in the NFL who are very good, right? And change the outcome of games, but nothing like the quarterback on the defensive side of things. So um, when you're looking at that, it's not like, okay, this guy's healthy. So that means, you know, this team is going to be elite again. It's really hard year over year. So that being said, I don't look too much into strength of schedules, but streaming quarterbacks is one thing that I will um, advocate and looking ahead and being able to tell like, okay, my quarterback has 
good matchups for the next two weeks. And then in the third week, you know, he plays like at Baltimore or something like that. So I know that I'm going to want someone who's playing at home against the Niners or the, the Raiders or something like that. Um, so, so I will advocate for strength of schedule. I think the, the greater point is don't, don't harp on it too much. So no, I'm sorry. Talk, talk about your mans. All right. So Josh Allen and, I agree with, with a lot of what Nick said. Like, re- we remember the Jaguars from a couple years back, right? They were elite. Last year, they were still pretty good, but they weren't, like, near the Bears or, like, the Vikings in terms of, like, stopping offensive teams. Um, so what I'm going to do is I have a chart with how teams ranked against quarterbacks last year. I'll put it on the screen so it makes sense what I'm talking about. If the team is in green, that means that they allowed the 11th most fantasy points to the position or more. So green is, like, 1 through 11. Uh, yellow is going to be the middle 10. It's so like middle of the pack, so they could really swing either way this year, depending on, like, Green Bay. We all know that they added Adrian Amos and Zadarius Smith, and they added defenders through the draft, so they could either be elite or maybe just stay in that zone. And then red is, like, teams you, you want to try to avoid because at least teams like Dallas and Denver and Baltimore, they have that defensive identity that even if they lose a few pieces, they're still going to be a very strong defense. We've seen it year after year, them dominate time possession, and just uh, limit quarterback play, so – I'm splitting it up that way just so you could really visualize when to stream the quarterback and when they're going to be usable. And so with Josh Allen, right, you look at his beginning of the season schedule. He gets two New York teams, neither of which are very good, despite what their fan bases may think. Uh, (laughs) And then he gets Cincinnati. And Cincinnati's at home. That's his first home game. Those are three games you really want to target because not only are they terrible against the pass, all three of them ranked top seven in most rushing yards allowed to quarterbacks. And as we all know, Josh Allen, that's where he makes his hay. That's a say. I don't think that's a say. It makes his bread out of it. Is now. We're going to make it. Is sh- now. That's a big fact. We're making shit up 2019. <laughs> Sayings <laughs> on the fly. But, you know, these are teams you want to target. And with Josh Allen being the QB 15 off the board, that's in that range where you're not expecting a guy to be your week over week starter. You're kind of looking to, to stream or you, you want to draft somebody late or pick them up off the waivers. And with Josh Allen being like this contentious player who people don't have too much conviction about him being like a top 12 quarterback. The fact that you can get him this late and you can start the season hot, even week four against the Pats, like they'll probably shut him down because Bill Belichick is smart and he knows that, you know, if you limit his ground game, it's it's completely different. Where last year, I think he only had 30 rushing yards against them where that's still three points and I'll take three points here or there. But, you know, he starts the season hot and then he gets two pretty like decent matchups against uh, New England, who I might avoid, and then at Tennessee, which is something I really want to uh, avoid because they allowed less than 20 points a game last year. And we all know that, uh, they're trying to run the ball. They might just try to dominate time possession. And then he gets his bye. So you can drop him at that point. Nobody's going to be picking him up to play Tennessee. If they do and you're playing that guy, count your blessings because he's a fool. Uh, even I wouldn't do that. Yeah, so, well, the thing about, like, w- with Josh Allen and these late-round quarterbacks is, like, you, you draft him only for, you know, a certain piece of the schedule. Like, you're allowed, you could do that when you're playing in a one-quarterback league. It's the same thing. Um, I get asked, like, oh, what defenses should I be playing? And um, – it's the I stream defenses completely right I never I don't draft the defense thinking that I'm going to play them for the entire year and, and going back to your point like how Jacksonville's defense fell off I think that like you look at a team like Chicago right that was very heavily carried by their defense it was almost like an outlier every year that you expect regression coming from them um so I think <laughs> my roommate's a Chicago fan so he's looking at me when he heard that I was really excited nine about. and seven yeah <laughs> uh, nine and seven nine and seven missing the playoff cut <laughs> um so yeah when when you're drafting i think like taking streaming into account just l- something that would help you so much is just looking at the early season schedule like for defenses since i know that i'm going to be streaming week to week all i'll do is i'll take a defense in the second to last round i'll see who has the easiest schedule in week one right and that's it like if the defense is playing at home if they're favorite in the game a low over under i know that's a very good setup for them to produce fantasy wise. Right. And, and it's a good point with Josh Allen starting off with uh, the jets, the giants, the Bengals, And I would probably stay away from the Patriots, but by that point you could find someone else just because um, the bills have a low key, like great pass defense. And I feel like that's going to be a very ground heavy game for new England and, you know, run a lot of clock. But uh, the overall point being is, you know, you could go three weeks at a time and then pick up someone who, um, what was Josh Allen, like the 16th quarterback off yeah, the board or something like 15. that. Yeah. Going exactly. great. So it's not like you need to use anything earlier than a 12th, 13th round pick on a guy like Josh Allen. And then there will be, um, whether it's like a Mitch Trubisky or uh, Matt Stafford sitting on the wire. And I'm sure one of them has a good week four, five, six matchup. 
Yeah, and on top of that, after his bye, he gets Miami and Philly. Both games are going to be at home, and he torched Philly last year. In the, or not Philly, Miami. In their two games, he totaled over 230 rushing yards combined and I think a handful of scores. So that's, that's another thing that really adds to his ceiling. And they added a lot of weapons for him. Cole Beasley in the slot is better with, than what they had last year. Uh, John Brown in the outside is a little bit of a more refined receiver, whereas he was relying on Zay Jones and uh, Robert Foster. And we talked about their offensive line getting like a little bit of an improvement. I don't expect them to be a pass-heavy team, but they don't need to be for Josh Allen to be a good quarterback for you to begin the season at least. And the fact that you can pick him up off the wire or draft him late, as Nick said, like he's going to be a good quarterback for you to start the year. And, you know, he, he ended last year over the last, I think, five or six weeks as the QB1 overall. And if people weren't bought into him then, and he has these five or six really good games to start the season, and in one quarterback league, somebody might be, like, screwed over by one of their top ten, like, quarterback picks and maybe want to move for Josh Allen. You're not going to get, like, an elite piece for him, but at least you can trade a guy who should be sitting on the waiver wire. What, uh, what do you think about Robert Foster? Because I can't really – decipher like I'm most likely going to end up not taking anyone in this passing offense but um Robert Forster kind of intrigues me because you know he was sitting at uh, he came out of USC or uh Alabama excuse me um and he was behind a, a lot of talent and didn't really get much opportunity to play but clearly he's an NFL caliber athlete right and then he exploded in, in that same stretch where Josh Allen kind of exploded and he got most of his production via, you know, his, his legs. But Robert Foster was also dominant through the air. Um, so he's someone that, like, I, I kind of think of as uh, a late-round flyer that might have a little bit of upside. Although, like, I, I think it's weird that they added uh, – not weird that they added John Brown, but it's almost um, – and I don't know Robert Foster that well. I probably have to watch a little bit more game film on him. But it almost seems like a redundant talent to add to the roster, no? Yeah, he's a bigger player. I believe he's six foot two. But for me personally, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ever going to really start Robert Foster in a league. So I'd rather take him in a best ball format where you don't have to make those decisions. But definitely over the first couple of weeks when he gets these matchups against soft secondaries, mm -hmm. if he does have a couple like 70, 80 yard games, maybe you can throw him in like your second flex spot and, you know, a deeper league. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I think he's someone that could probably like if he's going to break out, we'll probably see it coming early. And then he's going to be like a, an early um, an early waiver wire pickup. And, and just going back to something you said, you like uh, – you said they play Philadelphia, right? And it was a good matchup. But at the same time, like, that's why I don't like looking at strength of schedule. Like, as soon as that comes out, right? And then you could type in, like, fantasy football, strength of schedule online, and you'll see a bunch of people's, like, pop up. But if you do it based off of just um, – all of these strength of schedules that these people make are extremely non-predictive in a sense, right? Like, it just goes off of how many fantasy points they allowed. But if you think back to last year, like, Phil Philadelphia's entire secondary was – washed like they were just picking up dudes off the street to play cornerback for them by by week eight or nine you know so they didn't have any starters um so it's like philly is not the team that they were last year at that point and you know like you look at the falcons probably and they were decimated by injuries um but at the same time like you try to be as realistic as you can right because if you ask any fan of any team um you know no no one is going to say that they're going under eight and eight this year everyone is a playoff team this year but like there are going to be teams that go three and 13 and four and 12 and five and 11. Right. And uh, I think like the big part of that is trying to understand what made this team either bad or good last year on the defensive side of things. Um, and don't like take these strength of schedules that you find online as black and white. So um, with, with, you know, looking back at like Philadelphia for, uh, per se, um, they're going to be a lot better on the defensive side of things, but, um, but you know, that, that was just kind of the takeaway that I had with these things. So Josh Allen, um, so what are you suggesting? Draft early um, and then probably look elsewhere? Yeah, draft him – either draft him late or there's probably like a ton of people in your league that don't want him at all. Just pick him up off the waiver wire and you get a handful of good matchups to start the year. And maybe you can trade him for like a, a deep wide receiver piece that you believe in uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to just dropping him on the waiver wire where you don't get anything out of him. Yeah, and also um, – so as we're moving more into like a super flex kind of uh, – I don't know the right word I'm looking for here, but, you know – with these quarterbacks, when I think of one quarterback league, like, do you have a specific strategy that you go into um, with quarterbacks? Because I think when you're drafting in a one quarterback league, the fact that you can just get anyone pretty much at like any time, it's just so easy to navigate the quarterback pool. I almost don't even acknowledge the guys with high floors, right? Like a Josh Allen is someone that intrigues me in a one quarterback league because, you know, he has such a high ceiling and year over year, there's a few guys that pop out from the late rounds that use that high ceiling and, and end up as top five quarterbacks. Right. Um, so, 
you could take chances with that. And if he doesn't work out, Mitch Trubisky, who has another high ceiling, will just be waiting on the wire. And Sam Donald, who might break out, will be waiting on the wire. Uh, when you're in a two quarterback or super flex leagues, all these quarterbacks go off the board relatively early, right? So you don't have that leniency to take chances on quarterbacks. You can't just be like, oh, I'll take Josh Allen in the you know 13th round or pick him up off the wire because he's, you know, you're using your sixth or seventh round pick on that guy. Um, so like, do you approach drafting a quarterback um, differently from one quarterback to super flex leagues? Or are you just like, I like this guy as a fantasy quarterback and you kind of just play it off value? I personally don't play in any super flex leagues right now. I'm trying to move into more of them. But as for one quarterback leagues, the past couple of years, I've been just drafting guys. Well, we, really played high. In, we played in one. Uh, well, I did a subscriber league, right? You and me played together in a super flex. Yeah, that was, that was a mess. I was pretty bad <laughs> in that one. I, was, <laughs> I, like, I wasn't going to get into the standings or anything. I had like Tom Brady. Yeah, I think we both fucking shit the bed on that one. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just go for guys with high ceilings. If I can remember correctly, in like my main leagues, I just go for like a Carson Wentz a few years back coming off his rookie season or like a Matt right. Stafford off a of down year. And a guy like Josh Allen, right, he starts with a really easy schedule. So if he if he shits the bed the first couple of weeks against really good opponent or really good matchups or favorable games, just drop him. There's like you can pick somebody up off the waiver wire, like you said, a guy who nobody's given a chance like a Matt Stafford and – uh, but if he does produce in those games, you really get somebody uh, who's going to be good for your fantasy team and bring a lot of value at a cheap price. So that's how I kind of look at drafting quarterbacks in one QB league. Yeah, and it's like uh, all the quarterbacks I feel like from like quarterback 15 through 25, there's a lot of guys that have like high floors. So like Kirk Cousins is um, a guy that I think a lot of people will kind of peg as a bounce back. And I'm sure he'll end up finishing with like 4,400 yards and, you know, 27 or 29 passing touchdowns or something. But I feel like weekly or like Philip Rivers, for instance, is good because you're a Chargers fan, right? It's like Rivers historically um, has finished as like a top 12 quarterback, but in like points per game, he's usually like 13, 14 ish. And that's not a guy that you want starting in your. Yeah, he's the Lamar Miller quarterbacks. At the end of the season, it looks good because he played, but exa- exactly. You exactly. want to start him? And those are the guys that, like, I warn people to stay away from in one quarterback leagues because you want the guys that give you a high weekly ceiling. Like, sure, their stats might be there at the end of the year, but you have so much more, um, you know, you have so much more, I guess, leniency. I keep using that word, but you just have a lot more room to mess around with your quarterbacks. And I, I think, like, going for a high ceiling is really important in one quarterback leagues because, like, at the end of the day, the scoring – um, is going to be so m- minimal in terms of like points per game differential. So if you can have the weeks in which your quarterback, instead of going for 18 every week, you know, you can hit on a couple of those like 28 or 38 point games or something. I think they make all the difference. So a guy like Lamar Jackson uh, makes me nervous in super flex leagues. Cause again, you're going to have to use a lot of capital on him. Um, but in one quarterback leagues, he's great because you know, you'll see within the first couple of weeks what that offense is going to be doesn't work out drop them but you, you can't do that in, in leagues where quarterbacks actually matter so change your league to super flex that's a very good uh, promotion for super flex leagues <laughs> um, but as for this video you know it's it's uh as for like streaming it's more of a one qb type of thing and uh, yeah. i believe you have kyler murray up next to he's gonna be a guy that you're gonna spend a little bit of a higher draft capital on but he's not a guy that you're probably gonna drop throughout the year right he gets a bunch of good matchups, but he's actually going to bring you like a ceiling with his legs and also his arm talent's going to give you a decent enough floor. Yeah, dude, I'm, I'm so intrigued by what's going to happen in Arizona. Uh, and I tweeted this out there. There's just so many things that seem like they're going to be just crazy in this NFL season. And maybe we say that every year, but it's like, look at Arizona and Oakland. Uh, I really am interested to see what happens in New York, uh, Baltimore with Lamar Jackson, it's a lot of a lot of good storylines, and I think Kyler is like one of them. Um, and since he's been drafted, you know, number one overall, he's quickly shot up uh, fantasy draft boards. And I think at this point, I I got the ADP yesterday from Draft.com, and this is obviously a little bit sharper of ADP. And I'm sure on like Yahoo or ESPN, he's probably going like the 140s or something. But right now, he's quarterback nine overall, um, going within the first hundred picks. And that, I mean, for me, I, I, in one quarterback leagues, I probably just don't take quarterbacks that early, no matter who it is. Um, but if you look at Kyler's schedule, he has virtually one bad matchup over the first 11 weeks of the season. And week 12, the Cardinals have their bye, and then it gets really tough after that. So that one tough matchup is week two. They play at Baltimore. So it's like um, Kyler, I don't want to say he's matchup proof, but rushing quarterbacks, right, I, I feel like a lot of – um, past defenses that are strong aren't really relevant to that because they're going to, you know, they're going to get theirs through through the ground. Uh, it's just going to be really interesting to see how much 
fantasy impact Kyler has from a passing standpoint. But, you know, they, they play Baltimore in week two. Um, and within those first 11 weeks, the other tough games are against Seattle, but that's at home. And Seattle's not the Seattle that we, you know, uh, were used to knowing for a long time and, and that, that stingy defense. Um, and the other tough game is in New Orleans at, in week eight. And it's like, I mean, they're going to be in the Superdome. And I can only imagine Kyler's going to put up 35 points. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be on turf and, and thrown in a dome. Um, so it's like those are the toughest matchups. But it's really at Baltimore week two is the only one that's really tough. The rest of the games, they play San Francisco twice, Cincinnati, Atlanta, New York Giants, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Carolina, who was bottom 12 last year, both in coverage, pass rush. Like the schedule of the first 11 weeks is, is ridiculously easy for um, for Arizona and this passing offense. But once you hit week 12 in that bye, um, then it gets tough. They play the Rams, Pittsburgh, they're at Seattle, uh, Cleveland, and I'm not really sure how you know good they're going to be, but they're definitely not um, you know, Atlanta, Cincinnati, and, and San Francisco. Uh, and then I'm looking at some some people who are like later in the drafts that you could possibly pair with. And you know, I, I throw these names out here, but it's not like you don't want to draft a guy, a quarterback, and have him sitting just so you can get a good like week 15 matchup, right? You're not gonna have him sit on your bench for 15 weeks. But um, I, you know, I think pairing, you know, the the old with the new, Kyler Murray and, and Tom Brady here. And I'm not an advocate of Brady this year in fantasy whatsoever. Um, he was extremely mediocre over the second half of the season. Most of the season last year, he was not scoring a lot of points. Um, he wasn't really a top 12 quarterback in, in most of the weeks going down the stretch. But uh, in week two, when Kyler actually plays Baltimore, so you can draft them together because uh, Tom Brady plays Miami. And Miami was awful last year in, in both coverage and pass rush. And over the last three seasons, Brady's played against Miami five times. He's averaged 275 passing yards and 2.8 passing touchdowns a game. Um, so I think he's someone that you could throw in if you do draft Kyler early. Um, Tom Brady is a guy that you can draft as like the quarterback 20, right? And you'll know that you're safe when he plays at Baltimore. See what happens in week one. If Kyler explodes for like 125 yards on the ground and you're like, okay, he's going to give me those ground yards every week and like I'm good starting him regardless of matchup, cool. Um, but if you want a backup plan, Brady's going to be playing against Miami. And then you look later in the season uh, when Kyler plays Pittsburgh week 14, Brady's at home versus Kansas City. So you got to love that matchup, right? Mad points are going to be thrown around, scored, on, and, and Brady's probably going to get his. Cincinnati's in week 15, another really uh, <coughs> easy pass defense. So um, I, I think I think that's a good uh, a good pairing there for people to keep an eye on if you are a, a Murray owner this year. Yeah, another point in Murray's favor. Like, we've seen a bunch of rookie quarterbacks come out and dominate just because defenses don't, like, know what to expect out of them at that point. Uh, yeah. We saw Deshaun Watson really <laughs> blow up. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, I know he wasn't a rookie, but he didn't play much his rookie year. He got one game in, and he dominated. And those were guys where yeah, he was pretty good last year. I mean, he was decent. I, mean, I didn't <laughs> own him anywhere, so I can't. Yeah, decent, extra medium. <laughs> and yeah, those were guys where they had a lot of hype uh, going into the draft, like the NFL draft and fantasy drafts. And after they started to produce, people were sending like godfather offers to acquire them. And if Kyler Murray's at that level and he starts off like a Patrick Mahomes, like 70 touchdown pace, like over the first three or four weeks, <laughs> like that's that's a massive haul you can get for a guy who. Quarterback nine, he might move up, but I I venture to say he stays around there just because there's a little bit of risk base baked in with him uh, in this offense. If you can get a massive haul for him early in the season with those matchups, like no passing on that. Like you you got to take that. And, yeah, I, I try to estimate what I think Kyler Murray's floor is because when I look at the ceiling, like quarterback nine is high. I think he'll probably get up to like seven or eight. Um, I think it's it's really debatable between him and a guy like Russell Wilson or you know Drew Brees in, in that range. Um, and actually, Drew Brees is further down the rankings for me. But Kyler, like I, I really think in his range of outcomes is uh, like a, a top five or six fantasy quarterback. Because you look at like what Cam Newton did his rookie year; he was the quarterback three, I think, in fantasy, and that was uh, while leading the Panthers, who were a bad team. They were, I think, six and ten that year, right? And that's probably what we can project from. Arizona and, and speaking on like your point with rookie quarterbacks um, rookies you know don't have the most poise in the pocket and that typically you know, leads to bad things in the real NFL but it leads to a lot of valuable things in fantasy because when you don't have the poise in the pocket one I think you make rash decisions and you throw the ball deep a lot which will eventually convert into some deep passes yeah, Miss Wilson. Also, yeah <laughs> exactly and you also scramble out a lot so those are two things that you know when you're a fantasy quarterback obviously translate into um, I guess success in a sense, it can kind of be a double-edged sword, but um, I, I think Kyler's range of outcomes is, you know, top five is definitely in there because he's so good through the air and with his arm. Um, and I'm not really sure what his floor is, to be honest with you, because I, I want to, 
I think yeah. his floor is something like a Mitch Trubisky, what we saw last year, right? Like Mitch Trubisky wasn't running like a ton, but he did get a lot of yards on the ground. And as you said, he was scrambling around a lot. I remember, I think it was against the Patriots. Uh, they were sending pressure in the red zone and the guy ran around for like 10 minutes and just ran it in. And yeah. that's something you can expect out of Murray if teams are really getting through that offensive line. Like, yeah, it's, it's so, so hard to project the floor only because every time I want to project like a shitty floor, I'm like, but he's just too good at passing the ball. Like he's going to put up numbers through the air. So it's hard to... It's hard to say, like, oh, yeah, like, that's a good comparison, Mr. Trubisky, because he did end up finishing, I think, like, 12 or 14 overall, right? Um, but it's super sporadic. And I'm like, Kyler is just so much more accurate throwing the ball. So um, I, I think Kyle, Kyler will return value if you can get him around quarterback 10 or, or 12 or something like that, which I expect him to probably be going in family and friend leagues and things like that. Yeah, another quarterback who I think can easily return value, and we've talked about him in the last video, was Dak Prescott, right? He moved up a little bit. Uh, he's QB 16, so he's still not really like a coveted asset in the sense that he's going to be taken off the board in the top 10 rounds. Um, but you look at his early season schedule, right? The Giants at, Wa uh, yeah, at Washington, Miami at New Orleans, Green Bay, the Jets, Philly. That's all before his bye. And I guess you could say maybe Green Bay, like they're better this year with uh, the pieces that they acquired in the offseason. And at New Orleans, they had a really down year after being one of the better defenses the year prior, but it's going to be in a dome and it could be a shootout. Who knows? So like the, the worst matchups over that span are still pretty good. Cause you know, even green Bay, like they love to throw the ball. It's going to be a game where maybe they're playing from behind or deck needs to score. Bro. Do you yeah. remember that Cowboys Saints game last year? Which one? It in was, the playoffs? I, I wasn't even like saying this to make you feel like an asshole, but it was a fucking amazing game. It was a really like defensive battle. I think it was, and the score ended up being like 14 to 11 or something, but it was, it was so good. It was probably like my favorite game to watch all year. It was, um, it was the first time I think we got to see like the Cowboys linebackers on, on full display, like Vander Bosch. Is that his name? Uh, Vander Esch. Vander Esch. I don't know why I said Vander Bosch. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the techno. twins from the social network or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but that was, that was a fucking great game. Anyways, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, so maybe you want to fade that one after that big fact just uh, got dropped right <laughs> in my face. But uh, we, we all know, like, those splits with and without Amari Cooper, and I'll put it up on the screen if uh, you guys haven't seen it or you forgot about it. But, you know, he, he really came into his own after they finally <laughs> – you guys won't see what's going on. Um, <laughs> he really came into his own after uh, they acquired this piece um, to really open up this offense because they were relying on Cole Beasley and Michael Gallup and um, now that the fact that they have a guy like Amar Cooper who can play on the outside, can play in the slot, Zeke's catching passes, it really opened up this offense. And, you know, he's, he brings a good floor with his legs. Uh, we all know he scored 18 touchdowns over his first three years and six in each. Um, and that, like, that floor he has plus the upside with Amari Cooper and the schedule he has for the first eight weeks of the season or seven weeks of the season, the fact that you can get him as QB 16, um, it's really undervaluing him because – it's basically half your fantasy season. You're getting a quarterback who you can roll out there and a guy who's been in the QB1 discussion and has finished in that range over his first three seasons. Um, I'd venture to say over those first seven weeks, he's going to be a top 10 guy just because of who he plays and the type of quarterback he is giving you value on the ground and through the air. So um, after that, though, he does get a few of the tougher matchups, Minnesota, Buffalo, and Chicago. So if you want, just, yeah, after the bye, I'd have no problem just shipping him off or just putting him on the wire and streaming somebody else over that spin. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold my DAC takes because in yesterday's video, we're filming this on Saturday morning, but on Monday's video, huge clickbait season. It was my favorite late round picks with league winning upside. <laughs> and um, DAC was the quarterback I had talked about in that. And I went in, in pretty depth. I didn't even really mention the schedule. Um, but just overall, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in love with Dak this year for fantasy. Um, over the second half of the year, last year when Cooper was there with the splits, like you said, if you pace that out, man, he has um, – He's throwing the ball like 35 times a game, which is like top 12 numbers. It was up from like 29 and a half to 35 and a half, like six more attempts per game. Um, and it was – yeah, it was pretty crazy what we saw in Dallas. And I think this is the first year that they threw the ball in – uh, nearly like 57% of their passes. They've been down at like 51, 52 years prior. And they have the new OC, Kellen Moore. So I think they're going to be like a more um, well pass rounded. friendly and like non-historic offense. So um, it, it should be good things in Dallas. I'm a fan of, of Dak. Yeah, the one last thing um, over in the fantasy playoffs, right? Week 15 and 16, he gets the Rams in Philadelphia. And as there, you already brought up Philadelphia, you know, last year was kind of an, uh, an anomaly year where they were like mm -hmm. bottom of the pack when they had a bunch of guys hurt. He's on the road in that game. That might be a game where you think, like, by that time, by week 16, we know what Philly's going to be. 
But right now, just looking at it, that might be a game where you actually might want to fade. And last year he played – well, this year he plays the Rams in Week 15, and last year the Rams didn't allow a single rushing touchdown to a quarterback, and they were like bottom 12 in rushing yards allowed. So um, maybe don't expect Dak to do too much on the ground that game. But then again, that game's at home for the Cowboys, so it could be a high-scoring affair. I want to look at the Rams' depth chart right now on defense because I haven't really looked into it, but I feel like last year they just added like seven – it was like a Madden roster. Yeah, they like just like signed Peters all the guys. And- yeah. They already had to leave, right? Or they but I wasn't sure if it was like a one-year thing or they still have. I mean, Sue is gone, yeah. right? Um, I want to look at their cornerbacks. Yeah, they got to keep to leave still. Uh, Marcus Peters, where are you? Is Marcus Peters gone? Oh, no, he's still there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the point with being was that, like, I felt like the Rams kind of put themselves together for a really big one-year sprint that obviously mm-hmm. didn't work out. Um, but it seems like they got most of their defensive pieces. But um, – yeah, they're probably going to be a tough team to compete with. And, I mean, their offense puts up a lot of points, but if a keep leaves on the field, he's usually shutting down whoever the wide receiver one is, and that, and, you know, kind of exponentially hurts the quarterback. But um, I have nothing else to add. I don't even yeah. know what the fuck I'm talking about. Well, well, we'll stick on the Rams because we're going to go over to Jared Goff. These segues are getting crazy out here. Um, he's currently <laughs> the QB 12. So that's kind of the range where – you're kind of expecting a quarterback to be your starter for the whole year because obviously it's a top 12 quarterback and he's going a little bit higher than the rest of these guys. So you're spending capital uh, passing up on position players um, Mm -hmm. and really expecting Goff to be your guy. So he starts the season with over the first eight weeks, he doesn't play a team that I think was, or one team outside the top 18 in like points allowed to the position last year. He gets Carolina, New Orleans, Tampa Bay, San Fran, Atlanta, Cincinnati. They were all terrible. And then he gets Cleveland. That's a great it, fucking schedule. And then he gets at Cleveland and at Seattle, which, you know, it could be a little bit tougher. But last year against Seattle, uh, both games that they played, because they're obviously uh, divisional opponents, they went over 30 points in both. And Goff had one good game in the other in uh, that game in those matchups. But um, you might be able to expect a little bit more this year without Todd Gurley and them maybe leaning on the passing game more. But yeah, was, Goff, sorry, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here. Goff is a guy that, like, he has major splits, right? He's a guy like Breeze or Big Ben, and those guys I'm, I'm, I'm much more okay with owning in one quarterback leagues because you know when to start them. Like, when you take Jared Goff out of California, right, and he's playing in cold weather against yeah. the Bears and shit, like, he needs to be in sunshine to prosper, you know? If it's late in the season and it's below 40, right, it's not surfing weather, like, Jared Goff will not be in your fantasy lineup. So it's like, that's – that's great in one quarterback leagues because you could pick up whoever's playing the Raiders that week. But um, I tend to stay away from guys whose splits are are drastic when it comes to um, really any split that you can kind of point out that you know is going to affect the team um, like majorly. And I have a uh, quarterback rankings video, I think, coming out tomorrow. And there are a few guys whose splits are, are like super concerning. So if you want to know more about like I think it's my top 15 quarterbacks uh, – Tune back in tomorrow. All right, yeah. And um, just going off that point, right, he plays – he goes to Arizona, which is, you know, it's good weather, but it's a terrible matchup. He goes at Pittsburgh, which is week 10, so that's when, like around November. That could be pretty shitty weather. And mm-hmm. uh, But then other than that, even without these splits, right, he plays Chicago, Baltimore, at Dallas after the bye. These are all really tough matchups. And you look last mm-hmm. year, he only finished as a top 12 quarterback seven times. And in those seven games – only three times it was against above average defenses, not even like elite, just above average. They were 16th or worse in points allowed. It was like the Chargers and a few others. So he's not really like the model of consistency or that locked in QB one, but over the first half of the year when he's playing these easy teams and with this good weather, like he gets New Orleans at home, Tampa Bay at home, San Francisco at home, Cincinnati at home. And the games on the road are going to be other than Cleveland, they're going to be pretty good weather like Atlanta and, Carolina unless a hurricane goes through so um but you, you know he, he's a guy that you can pick up he it's going to be a really good offense as we all know and they might run uh they might run more passing plays just because of Gurley being injured unless they want to like still run the ball 30 times a game just split it evenly between Henderson and Gurley and this was a team that led Goff to having the second most red zone attempts last year I believe it was 103 and he did pretty well there so he's gonna have the volume certainly to uh, be able to produce in that area of the field. And just overall, we all know that, you know, they have a ton of weapons. And he, he's one of the quarterbacks that if you want to rationalize him being very good, you can say, look at all these guys he plays, look at the the matchups he has, and you can put him out there every week with confidence. Yeah, he's in such a good position just being 
the quarterback in this Rams offense. I mean, just look at the pieces around him, man. Woods, Cooks. Um, he's much better with Cooper Cup on the field, although I'm not sure we're going to get a full-strength Cooper Cup until, you know, a month or two into the season. Either way, though, um, he's almost like one of those quarterbacks I had talked about, you know, the high floor guys, um, but but also gives you a nice weekly ceiling every once in a while, like we saw against the Chiefs game, which is out of control. But he he throws up every once in a while, you know, those those big games because – He's a pretty good deep ball thrower, right? And he'll hit Cooks for the long touchdown, and he'll hit Woods for the long touchdown every once in a while. And that um, we'll get him over that 300 yard mark and three touchdowns and whatnot. Um, so yeah, Goff's a guy I like. Uh, I'm not necessarily targeting, but he's not a guy that I'm, I'm fading. Yeah, and if you want to trade him, a little argument you could make, I guess Nick briefly brought it up, is the Cooper Cup splits. If we expect him to not be 100 percent through like the first half of the season, they get their buy in Week Nine. If you want to try to deal him and get a good piece for him, you could go to a little owner in your league and be like, hey, Cooper Cup isn't 100%. I know they don't get the best matchups, but look at these splits. All right, th- those are the splits right there. And you can just show him, like, look how much better he is when Cup is at 100%. And now coming off the bye, he's going to be uh, – he's going to have fresh legs. He's going to be fully implemented into this offense. And maybe you can pull a quarterback who starts with, like, harder matchups and really take advantage of whatever owner is uh, disappointed in their current QB play. Yeah, we call that finesse. We call that the splits finesse. I like that. Who's next? Matty Ice. Now, this one is a little a little Watch controversial. He's currently the QB6, uh, I believe pick like 89.9, so he's almost at 90. Um, that's math for you guys. Uh, so he starts the season, right? I think his first 11 games are indoors, and there's all these splits and all these different things with him being great indoors uh, as opposed to outdoors. But you look at the teams he plays when he's indoors, it's Minnesota, Tennessee, Arizona, at Houston, the Rams, Seattle, at Indianapolis. These are a bunch of tough matchups, right? They could really hinder his performance despite playing indoors. And if, if you're listening to these people say, oh, he plays 13 to 16 games indoors, he's awesome indoors. Are we, like, do you think that him being indoors trumps the fact that he's playing, like, at Minnesota, Tennessee, at Arizona, like these really tough defenses? I also, yeah, I, I also want to make a point on that because um, – the website Pro Football Reference is awesome for splits, like advanced splits like that. And I see people tweeting out, like, Matt Ryan is elite when he's indoors. And that was the case last year. Like, his splits last year indoors versus outdoors are drastic. And he's he was way better indoors. But if you look at 2017 and 2016, in both of those two seasons, his numbers were identical, whether he's outdoors or indoors. So this will be a narrative that pushes him up um, and – the fact that one, it's not really that true, um, and two, you're right, he's playing tough matchups. So I still like Matty Isaac. I would rather have him indoors and outdoors, but I think um, people will will probably push that to the point where they're using it too much to draft him in, in that favor. So I'm with you. I think that's like a sneaky low takeaway uh, to understand that that's not necessarily like a an auto buy on Matt Ryan. Yeah, and the people that do only listen to these things, right, and he plays these first 11 games against these tough defenses, maybe he puts up like four or five duds. Those are the people are like, oh, he was supposed to be good in these games. He had all these favorable matchups, this, these weather conditions, he's indoors. They're going to be maybe like a little irritated with him and aren't going to be so bought into him thinking, oh, if he's like this indoors, what's he going to be outdoors when he plays after his bye week? And that's when you can really like try to uh, acquire him and attack because – after his bye, he still only plays three games outdoors. One of them is week 17, and the other games he plays are Carolina and San Francisco, two teams who aren't great uh, defenses. And if you look at his splits uh, against Carolina, he's like seven points per game better when he faces them, and they're divisional opponents. So, like, it's a pretty big sample, right? He's, he's playing them twice a year. And uh, the other teams he plays after the bye, New Orleans, Carolina, Tampa, New Orleans, Carolina, San Francisco, all of them top 11 in fantasy points allowed to the position. And even New Orleans, right, that could be a shootout. It's still in a dome. So he's mm-hmm. going to be a guy who maybe I pass up on him because uh, players like Christian Kirk and Sterling Shepard are going around that ADP. Maybe you pass up on him there, stream quarterback for, uh, what is it, the first nine weeks up until his bye, and then maybe you try to acquire him after he's disappointing a few owners. I like that. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers right now. 2017, um, his touchdown-interception ratio in domes, 11 and 11, 11 to 11 outdoors nine to one like Jesus. with a quarterback rating of 104 compared to 84 like outdoors versus dome so um make sure you put everything into context i'm going to send you over these splits so you can throw them on the screen when i was talking mm-hmm. about them earlier 
for 2017 and 16. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, I like that because Matt Ryan might sneakily struggle and then people might kind of buy out, uh, buy out of him there. I think the volume in this offense with Dirk Cutter will you know allow him to be good enough, but not to the point where if you reached up or drafted him like quarterback five or something, um, you'll probably end up being disappointed. Yeah. And at that price, like people are going to, they're going to be upset when he doesn't produce, especially like going along with that narrative. And another guy who has these crazy splits, right, is Drew Brees, currently the QB7, which I personally think is a little high for a guy getting up there in age and who doesn't really use too Way much on his legs. High. And yeah, and this will be in my quarterback rankings too, like the splits for Brees. He's one of the guys with major drastic splits. Um, last year, he had basically six good games. Um, the his rest, home, of, his, the his rest of his – The rest of his – sucked. Yeah, his home and road splits were terrible. He had six good games. All of those games – if you – this is like you can't contextualize it a season more so than what Breeze did because his games that he popped off for were against like literally the worst defenses in the NFL. And like one of them was against Philly when they had no cornerbacks and it was like Atlanta, Cincinnati, Tampa Bay. And it was like those were the only games he did well in. And they were – the majority of them were at home. Um, the rest of them, tough defenses on the road, all – things that like Breeze couldn't overcome. And these were all, all splits that you could take it. These were all splits that um, had been a problem for Breeze for the majority of his career, right? And then last year, 2017, he kind of didn't have a bad road home split. So everyone kind of forgot about it for a year. And then they came back last year. So Breeze is a guy, I'm not going to say he's on my do not draft list just because the offense it will produce a lot of points and a lot of good will come out of that. Um, but I don't. He, he has nowhere near the ceiling that a lot of people will probably draft. With. Yeah, at his current ADP too, QB seven. You're gonna have to reach on him. Like yeah, no guys like Mayfield are around that range, and even I believe Carson Wentz is going later than that. Who's a guy who'd rather have? Yeah, Wentz is going so far. Let me ask you: Would you rather have Kyler, Kyler Murray, or Kyler. I don't even need to hear the second name, Kyler Murray? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say Josh Allen. <laughs> Fuck, you got me. I'll just take both at that point. Would you rather have Josh Allen or Drew Brees? Uh, in a vacuum, or like considering their ADP? Uh, in, in a vacuum. That makes it more tough. Uh, probably Breeze just because his end of season schedule is like really good, and obviously, like by that time we'll know more uh, when the time comes at that point of the season. But I just think he he's a safer option just because of the weapons he has, and we we know more what to expect out of this offense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'd probably go Breeze there too. As but for like, I'd probably regret it. <laughs> as for his early season schedule too you look at the teams he plays he starts off the year houston at the rams at seattle dallas those are like four really tough matchups then he gets tampa at home so that could be like a massive game and then he gets at jacksonville at chicago and arizona three defenses who absolutely lock up quarterbacks and then he goes into his bye that's like nine weeks that's a very good portion of your fantasy season and if you're spending a top seven quarterback pick on this dude he I wouldn't expect more than one or two good games to start the year. And it's similar to Matt Ryan, where if you're spending this much draft capital on a quarterback, you're going to want in one quarterback leagues, at least you're going to be frustrated by that point. And he's going into his bye week the trade deadlines coming up. You're getting nervous that maybe you don't have the quarterback you thought, and you're not going to drop him. You're going to try to trade him to somebody else who wants to take a risk. And if you're the one buying, you can, you can convince the owner, Hey, I'm the one taking on the risk. Drew Brees is getting older. Uh, last year, over the first, last four weeks, he only had three touchdowns. So you could really just like try to convince them that maybe he is falling off. The guy's 40 years old. Uh, he doesn't have as many weapons as he once had. Like uh, He still has Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara, but those are two guys, and I guess Jared Cook. But um, that guy kind of stinks. Uh, you, can, you can convince somebody that maybe like this is just who he is now, like people did with Tom Brady last year. But then you look at who he plays after the bye, Atlanta, Tampa, Carolina, Atlanta, San Francisco, and then Indianapolis is kind of tough. Our division is just a cheat code. It's fucked it, up. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> just draft the person, draft the quarterback in that in the NFC South who has the best defense because then they're going to play six teams who suck. So, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, up until week 16 after his bye, he has a bunch of really like easy matchups. Yeah, so he really has an easy schedule after the bye week uh, through pretty much the entire fantasy playoff. So if, if you're not going to draft him, which I kind of advise against at that current ADP, um, just try to make a move for him during his bye week when the trade deadline is creeping up. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And then, uh, lastly, Jimmy Garoppolo. Now this one's going to be short because he's not, um, he, he's not similar to the other guys in the sense that he doesn't have like an extremely long stretch of a favorable matchup. Um, he's currently QB 22, so 
obviously people aren't drafting him to be their starter or even like at that point, you're not even drafting him to be your streaming option. But you look at his first two games of the season and his last three, he gets Tampa and Cincinnati to open the year, beautiful matchups. And then he gets a bunch of like uh, bumpy matchups like Arizona twice, uh, the Rams, Cleveland. He has a bye thrown in there. But then to end the year, his fantasy playoff matchup, weeks 14 through 16, New Orleans, Atlanta, and the Rams. Those And the Rams are going to be at home when he plays them. And Nick Mullins went for three touchdowns against them last year. So those are three matchups where if you have a guy like uh, Dak Prescott who has a tougher end-of-season schedule, you can pick up Jimmy uh, Garoppolo off the waiver wire. By that point, we'll kind of know who he is. And even if he's like good up to that point, he plays Baltimore the week prior at Baltimore. So people might not even be rostering him at that point. Uh, you pick – yeah, if you have a deep bench or you have enough room for two uh, quarterbacks, pick him up the week before he plays Baltimore, uh, before people are really trying to grab him for those last three games. Um, and then if we know he's like been showing consistency throughout the year, roll him out there against New Orleans, Atlanta, and the Rams, and he can bring you that Josh Allen upside last year that we saw over the uh, last couple of games of the season. Yeah, you know what I want us to do um, for one of, if not the last video that we do Tuesdays before actual – season starts um like pretty much when people are about to draft maybe a week before we should do this episode again kind of mm -hmm. um but just focusing on streaming overall like really break it down where it's like okay if you're gonna draft this guy make sure you pair this quarterback with this quarterback and have um kind of like a flawless duo like three or four duos in which you can get an early quarterback and a late quarterback whose schedules like line up perfectly um and then also look at defenses who have, um, you know, honestly, I'm not opposed to rostering multiple defenses when you're streaming. I did that last year. There was points in the season in some of my teams um, where I would have, especially towards the playoff, like the end of the year, where I almost had three, I think I had three defenses on a couple of my rosters because I would look ahead and be like, I'm streaming, you know, and it's like they're playing against um, Oakland. And then I see another team is playing against like an Andy Dalton list, Cincinnati Bengals two weeks down the road. It's like, dude, I want those for my playoff matches and stuff. So I think right before we kick off, like we should have just a complete streaming episode of uh, like the best pairs and stuff. So throw that in the blog post for one of the later episodes. Yes, sir. And a quick tip just for that draft, the three teams, the NFC East, cause it'll be giants six times a year. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty huge. But um, the last thing I just want to bring up is as Nick said, with drafting two quarterbacks or rostering two guys, um, depending on the week. If you take Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, currently quarterback 22, and Phil Rivers, who's around that range, I think he's like QB 19, I'll put up a picture of their like matchups when they play together. They don't play, they don't have a single matchup uh, with their combined schedule that you should be afraid of other than week 13 where uh, Phil gets at Denver and Garoppolo gets at Baltimore. Other than that, the only times they play a defense who's outside the top 11 was uh, Phil Rivers in week six gets uh, Pittsburgh and Jimmy G gets at the Rams, but that could be high scoring. Um, Jimmy G gets Washington in week seven, but they were just outside that range. And uh, one more, I can't see it right now, but I'll, I'll throw it up there. And it, it, their, uh, their schedules match up flawlessly. And then in week 13, if you don't want to play either, Sam Darnold at that point of the season plays Oakland or Cincinnati, one of the two. Um, and that's just a guy who you can get cheap and, even in best ball, if you want to wait on quarterback and draft three guys instead of taking like two, like a really good one, a really good quarterback and like a middling one, you're going to take three guys. Just get Darnold, Garoppolo, and Rivers at the end of your draft and just uh, let draft.com do the magic of playing whoever does well that week. Yeah, that's, um, I like that. I, th I think that's probably the most like helpful thing we could do is actually, you know, giving people exactly who to take because, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, I like this guy, that guy. But if you can, you can match up, the matchup, the matchups. Like, do a little bit of research on your own behind the scenes, especially early in the season, man. That's that's so crucial. But it is tough to know which defenses are, you know, the ones that you should be targeting or staying away from, just because again, it's so hard to predict the year over year thing. Um, that's all we got on the agenda for today, I believe, right? Yes, sir. All right, so that's going to wrap up uh, this week's video with Noah. And make sure you are following him on Twitter. That's at FB God. You can annoy him with whatever questions you want. Uh, I won't be annoyed. I, I won't show it. You have, you have a guarantee for me that he will answer any and all questions, comments, concerns that come his way. Um, and that will uh, wrap it up until tomorrow morning. So make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're covering everything 2019 fantasy football forever, forever, and ever, and ever. And uh, that is it. We're out from the HQ. Thank you for staying this long. If you did. 
We'll see you tomorrow. Peace.